Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the virtual premises of the Polish Institute of International Affairs. I'm Patricia Sassel, I'm Head of Research at the Institute, and I have genuine pleasure to welcome you to this online conference and seminar on, the 30, on 30 years of Mercosur. We'll be looking at the significance and prospects for the organization. Um, in March, uh, the BLOC, or the Common Market of the South, as it is called, celebrated its 30th birthday. And the BLOC was founded by Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. It was seen in the 1990s as one of the most promising regional uh, integration initiatives in Latin America. Now, we are three decades later uh, looking at it again. We think it's a good uh, opportunity to, to, to take stock and think about the prospects for the, uh, for the organization. Now, in Poland, Mercosur has, hasn't, been, uh, hasn't featured pro prominently in public debates, to say the least. Now, we at PISM uh, have been trying to contribute to that debate and introduce Mercosur in public debates. Um, this seminar attests to, to that. Uh, I believe there are at least three reasons why this seminar is valid, uh, holding this seminar is valid right now uh, for Poland. First, it's because of the importance of uh, commercial ties between Poland and Latin America. Now, the interest in Latin America in Poland has been driven by economic interests uh, mostly although still the region is a marginal partner of Poland. Most of the bloc has the largest share in Polish Latin American goods exchange. Individually, Argentina and Brazil have been long in, in the top three uh, Polish partners in the region with Mexico in, in between the two. Now, the second reason why uh, this meeting is important is because of the EU-Mercosur Association Agreement. Uh, it matters the most because once it enters into force, it will define a new comprehensive framework that could boost Poland's relations with uh, South American, with the South American bloc. Yesterday, it was exactly two years since the talks about the deal were concluded. However, the prospects of ratifying the document are still uncertain because of the disagreements related to the commitments on environmental protection. Uh, the agreement's potential and opportunities are welcomed by some sectors of Polish business, but the Polish agriculture and food sector remains very critical of the deal and fearful of potentially strong Mercosur competition in the EU markets. Now, the third reason uh, I think it's important to hold this discussion is because of the people-to-people -people links. Both Argentina and Brazil host the largest uh, communities of Polish descendants in Latin America. Uh, a rough estimate um, for Brazil is about 2 million, which is second largest after the US uh, in the world. And in Argentina, there, there are perhaps half a million Polish descendants. In Paraguay and Uruguay, this is significantly smaller, perhaps several thousands. Now, uh, with this, uh, I want to invite you our discussion um, with three excellent panelists from Mercosur countries who will share their insights on the blog. Uh, we have a truly uh, Latin American weather today in Warsaw, <laughs> at least that connects us uh, today. Um, after they will have spoken, we will hear uh, from two, we will hear two European perspectives about the blog, its significance and prospects. Um, I just want to mention that we are being live streamed uh, on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. And with that, I pass the floor to Bartomi Znojek, uh, our own uh, in-house analyst on Latin American countries. Bartek, over to you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, that's, that's a great pleasure to chair the debate on Mercosur, its importance and prospects with three distinguished speakers from Mercosur countries. And let me first briefly introduce our panelists uh, and uh, for mostly thanks them, thank them for joining uh, at their early mornings, especially Renata Marau, uh, with, with uh, whom I would like to start. Dr. Renata Marau is adjunct professor of law at the American University in Washington, D.C., 
She's an experienced international trade lawyer, founder of a nonprofit international organization, Women Inside Trade, and that's uh, empowering women through its network of professionals, among others. She also acts as an independent trade advisor and has record in engaging in trade nego negotiations at the WTO, regional and bilateral levels. Uh, educated in Madrid, Santa Catarina in Brazil and Maastricht in ne the Netherlands, she has a, 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 she's a frequent visiting professor and lecturer in Brazilian universities. Second, uh, Dr. Felix Peña, he's one of the most respected Argentine experts in international economic relations, international commercial law and economic integration. He is currently director of the Institute for Inter International Trade at ICBC Foundation, but his long CV includes innumerable roles in academy, consultancy, as well roles in government administration of Argentina. He's a, he's a prolific author with regular analysis related to Mercosur, among other topics, and he was also personally involved in the development of the bloc. In 1998, 1999, he was a full member of Common Market Group of Mercosur, and he was also in the group of experts who prepared the project of the protocol for the Mercosur Parliament uh, in 2005. He, he also acts as arbiter in the Argentine group under the mechanism for Mercosur controversy solution of, from um, under protocol from Olivos. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Ignacio Bartesagi. He's one of the most renowned Uruguayan experts in the inter international trade and Mercosur. He's director of the Department of International Negotiations and Integration for the Catholic University of Uruguay. He combines rich experience as expert and consultant in academia, international organizations, and business chambers. He frequently comments and writes on the topics related to international trade, including Mercosur. Last year, he published a book where he analyzed tendencies in Mercosur on implementation of norms. And one of his recent work was coordinating a book dedicated to the role of the European Union in the convergence between Mercosur and Pacific Alliance. So that will be the presentation. But before we start, uh, a couple of uh, details regarding the, the debate itself. Uh, this will be, a f uh, we will have a form, a few rounds of questions. And of course, uh, there will be a chance to ask questions. Uh, I already encourage the audience to think about uh, what they would like to ask to our guests. Viewers on Zoom can use Q&A functionality and viewers on social media may write their questions on chat. Uh, feel free to write those your questions in English, Polish, Spanish, or Portuguese. So uh, going to the, to the debate, uh, if we look at 30 years of Mercosur, it's quite easy to point out what didn't work or failed. Uh, the common market of the South has never reached stage of a common market and remains an incomplete customs union. union. Intra-regional trade share remains loud, it's recently about 13-14%. On legal side, there are delays in national implementation of agreed norms. Some can criticize strict rules as the famous decision 32-00, which means that any preferential agreement must be negotiated by Mercosur jointly. Last but not least, you can read recent voices that Mercosur failed when it comes to coordination of battle against COVID-19 and pandemics has been hurting the region severely. But my first question uh, would rather go in other positive direction because I'd like to ask our experts on what is the importance of Mercosur for its member states on what they would say as uh, biggest successes of the bloc in its uh, 30 years. And that question in front of place, I would like to pass to Renata Amrau. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, especially with uh, Felix Peña and Ignacio. I know they are the real experts. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm leaving DC for quite a while. Of course, I still follow I'm Brazilian. I, I follow Mercosur very closely, but it's a real pleasure to be here with both of them, especially. Uh, I think, uh, um, of course, it's easy to talk um, about Mercosur in a um, sad way most of the times, uh, and we all analyze this, but this is, honestly, I don't think it's fair with the bloc entirely. Uh, I think Mercosur has benefited business uh, uh, among its uh, member states um, in a good way for several years. 
Uh, I think one of the most obvious benefits uh, that Mercosur has brought to its members is the freedom of movement, uh, both of its populations and uh, of goods uh, for doing business, uh, which has created a more dynamic commercial environment uh, throughout uh, this part of the South America, uh, which is often referred uh, as the Southern Corn, actually. Also, I think it's important to mention that there, there is and there was more, um, more in the past, of course, the uh, dynamism of the region that also has attracted greater investment. Um, for example, um, and, uh, I took some numbers from the World Bank on, on foreign direct investment in the region. Uh, just the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure projects financed by Mercosur, we, had a, we have a number of more or less $824 million invested for the past, uh, for the past decades. Uh, we have also, it's important to mention also, of course, the relationship between Brazil and Argentina in terms of numbers, because Brazil is the greatest trade partner of Argentina still since the beginning and still. Brazil represents 15% uh, of Argentina imports uh, of course, this number has in the beginning was around 25%. So, and Brazil is still the major partner of Argentina. And Argentina, behind China and the US, is the third trade partner of Brazil. This means a lot. So, it means that the, the trade and the exchange of goods and services between those countries are really major. Uh, and I don't think people really uh, acknowledge that when they talk about Mercosur. Uh, and it's true, of course, that um, after the first decade of rapid progress in the integration, um, it was followed by two decades of, of course, uh, backsliding, protectionism, not only in Mercosur, but currently around the world. So, uh, I think I think one uh, I think it's it's it, one of uh, one thing that I always like to to highlight when we talk about Mercosur is that of course we have problems we can talk a little bit more about the problems the problems are very evident in the region but there are also advantages and uh, that's why I, I believe that Mercosur uh, contrary to what we read in the media lately that the Mercosur is going to dismantle, that the countries are going to pursue agreements by themselves and everything is going to be, uh, it's going to be the end of Mercosur. I don't think that's going to happen because the bloc in itself, it's very important for the countries that are part of the bloc, uh, namely uh, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay and Argentina. And of course, Venezuela is suspended, but it's also a member of, of, the, of the bloc. So I think that this would be my first remarks. I think they are very important because it's it's as as you mentioned, Bart, uh, in the beginning, it's very common to talk about the sad things and the bad things about Mercosur, what it didn't achieve, but honestly, people don't talk much about the 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 reality. The countries that are part of the block really need the block, enjoy the block, the benefits of the block, and I think that's important to to mention. Thank you, Renata. And I would pass the, the, the same question to, to Felix Pena, especially because of his involvement in this, this uh, first decade of, of Mercosur. And something that uh, I haven't mentioned before is it's, uh, we shouldn't look at Mercosur as an only economic project because the, the, the antecedents of that was uh, important approximation between Argentina and Brazil in, 18, in, in 1985 uh, with, with the agreement of Foz de Iguazu, Iguazu. So I would like to ask Felix Peña how he sees the importance from Argentine perspective, uh, having in mind this uh, political importance. Thanks. Thank you very much again for the invitation. And I would say that if we want to understand today Mercosur, what that means, we cannot try to understand it only from an economic point of view, or eventually only from a political point of view. We need to 
introduce the three dimensions at the same time, simultaneously. Political dimension, economic dimension, a legal dimension, because we have a treaty. We have agreed in a treaty, and the treaty is today with us. Uh, I would say that saying this, we should always, when we analyze Mercosur today, or Mercosur in the beginning, introduce in our analysis three elements that were on the head of the political leaders that signed the treaty. The first one is very much related, particularly to Brazil and Argentina. The idea, but not only to Argentina and Brazil, the idea of peace and cooperation. The idea to try to work together, but to preserve among us peace and cooperation. And the result of Mercosur in this sense has been very positive. Why? Because nobody today could think in the possibility of developing from the point of view of Argentina or from the point of view of Brazil, particularly, the idea of developing nuclear arms. The agreement signed in the 80s about the non-development of nuclear arms in the region has extraordinary importance to understand the reason of Mercosur. We can talk a lot about this if you want. The second element is to have always a global perspective. We are working together because we want to develop our countries, but particularly we want to develop our countries because we have extraordinary possibilities at the global level. We want to be a very active global actor. And for that reason, we must work together. And the third element is precisely how to work together. The two first elements were related with the idea of why to work together. I would call it the existential elements of Mercosur. The third element is related with the idea of how to work together. And here is where we have today some problems. But to solve the problems, we must have in mind this approach of the three dimensions of Mercosur. We cannot solve the problem only with political consideration, economic consideration. We need to take into account the legal consideration because to change the treaty is something sometimes really, really complicated. And here is where we have three elements in the Treaty of Sassuncion that are crucial to discuss what we are discussing. The first element is Article 1st. Second element is Article 5. And the fourth, the third element is Article 2. Together, the three articles define the idea of a common external tariff. The treaty doesn't say nothing about a custom union. The treaty doesn't define what is a common market. The treaty says we must have a common external tariff. And that is relatively clear what is a common external tariff. It's an external tariff that is common to the four countries. That means that if we want to have different external tariff, we must agree in different external tariff. If not, we cannot have external tariff. And there are other elements that are defined in the treaty, in these articles, but particularly the key element is Article 2, that say we have common rights and common obligations. We will build Mercosur 
through the reciprocity of right and obligation. And let me finish this brief introductory commentary, trying to explain why it was said, what it was said in the treaty. Normally, when you have political leaders joining and signing treaties, they do that because there are some elements, among others, they agree what they are signing, but they have behind their head a concern. And that concern was exactly in that years, 1991, the possibility that one of the two major countries, Argentina or Brazil, could adopt a strategy of joining in a bilateral, bilateral free trade agreement with the United States. United States had in early 1990, announced the idea of an initiative of the Americas that was directed to Mexico, because Mexico, the main idea was to try to say, to tell the Mexicans, we are not dealing in a bilateral, only a bilateral agreement. We are working with all Latin America. And at the same time, Many people in both Argentina and Brazil perhaps were thinking of the possibility, wow, here we have the possibility of having a bilateral agreement with the United States that in that case, it would be very impossible, difficult to work together. And particularly, it would be very difficult to work together with a peace and cooperation approach particularly in the nuclear field. That is the reason why the treaty was drafted in that way. But now we have the treaty. We can go away, Brexit. We have, can change the treaty, obviously. That means we must agree to change the treaty. Or we could have uh, a possibility of finding a way to do the things that could preserve the unity without uh, breaking the treaty, I would say, and I really, I finish here, I would say that in that case, we should apply, according to our Brazilian friends, a diplomacia of Jaitinho, a Jaitinho diplomacy diplomacy, that means to find a way within the treaty. And the good news is that a treaty is not a perfect treaty. It's not, has not been written by, we say, Vela Balassa, no, no, nothing. It's a treaty, a political treaty, according to realities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felix Pena. Uh, now I would like to ask the same question to Ignacio Bartesagi, but with uh, emphasizing uh, something which is also important, uh, large asymmetries in Mercosur, because you have two big Argentina and Brazil. On the, on the other side, you have uh, Paraguay and Uruguay. And uh, this would be a question about uh, one of those small uh, countries. What what is the importance of Mercosur uh, for your country now, so looking at these 30 years? Thank you, Bartek, again for, for the invitation. And I really agree with all the words uh, uh, that, uh, uh, of course, Felix and Renata said. Uh, for Uruguay, okay, in terms of the uh, historical perspective, I think it's important also for Uruguay, the very important relation between Argentina and Brazil. Because uh, I agree with uh, Felix uh, that uh, this union between Argentina and Brazil is uh, very important uh, because of, of our region of peace. And if we are a small country that are between two big economies like Brazil and Argentina, we need cooperation between these two economies. And I agree totally with the perspective of, of Renata and, and, and Felix about that this is the more important thing that happens in Mercosur. The, the, to pass uh, a view from confrontation between Argentina and Brazil, 
for a view of cooperation. Because then after that was solved, Uruguay can see, okay, now I can deep, deep in my relation between this region. And also we can uh, sell this region outside uh, the South America. So uh, to understand Mercosur, we must review what happens in the 80s. And uh, that is it's part of, of, of history, but it's part of reality. In your question, Bartek, uh, really Mercosur is Argentina and Brazil relation. Uh, and Mercosur is what happens in the 80s. I think that not totally in the 90s. Of course, I agree with uh, Felix in the, in the legal perspective and uh, in the importance of our treaties, but we have to be uh, we have to be honest in that uh, we, we have rights and, and obligations in, in the treaties, in Asuncion's treaties, in, in, in Oro Preto protocol, but uh, we must comply and we must respect what we write in that treaties, because if not, it's, it's difficult to evaluate the real Mercosur. Uh, I think that the real Mercosur is uh, very far away from what we have in the treaties. Anyway, of course, if you ask, uh, your central question was, what are the important things that happened in Mercosur in these 30, 30 years? Well, I agree. Uh, it's, it, we, we have a, a very important uh, block that, of course, plays a role, uh, not like European Union uh, in strategic terms, but for South America, the link between Argentina and, and Brazil is very important in, in, in cooperation and in strategic. And of course, we, we as Renata said, we consolidate, uh, uh, we achieve a, a, a free trade zone. So that was really important because our intra-regional trade increased a lot in the first years in Mercosur. And uh, that is a very important relation between Argentina and Brazil at the moment, but also for Uruguay. Uh, Brazil is our second uh, market in importance after China, so it's really important for us. Uh, also, we, we advance in, in, in conform a partial common tariff. Okay, so we have some uh, advances in, 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 this, in this sense in, in, the, in, the, in the custom union. It's not perfect. We can talk about this in the, the next. We have a lot of problems in this uh, side, but anyway, we, 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 we implement a common tariff. We also have uh, institutions and uh, decision-making bodies. So we have uh, legal, uh, with, the, with this making bodies, we have decisions uh, and, and new obligations for, for the partners. So that, that is working and that always worked. Then we can discuss if that legal uh, normative it's it or not incorporate by the members, but it's other discussion. I think that the important thing is that Mercosur implement institutions and also a, 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 a dispute system that uh, it's having, it's not really dynamic at the moment, but it is there and it's also important. And the Mercosur also signed agreements with the region. And uh, recently, okay, not recently, two years ago, but we closed an agreement with the European Union. I think we're going to talk about this. This is the most important uh, success of the Mercosur since, uh, I think, since we signed the, the Europreto Protocol. Really, for the future of Mercosur, to sign a free trade agreement with the European Union is really something to, 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 to mark. It's really important. And also, we can uh, say that Mercosur uh, has a lot of harmonization in, 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 in different areas. And also, it's a very important um, forum of cooperation and political forum. We, we have a space, our presidents have a space where they can discuss, yes, we are not have we are not across in the best moment. <laughs> I, I agree. Everybody knows about this in the when we celebrate thirty years of Mercosur. Okay, we have at the moment some difference between our presidents, but I think that uh, in, in 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 historical perspective, this is one moment. Mercosur is there. Mercosur is in an important place uh, for Uruguay. We are okay. We are having a, a very uh, a very big debate about uh, that we want other Mercosur. 
we want to discuss to change some things in Mercosur. We want, we want a Mercosur more dynamic, but we want to be part of Mercosur. I think it's very simple to say, if, we, if you don't agree, you have to go and you, no, we want to discuss. We want to discuss inside Mercosur and with our members, but also uh, Bartek and audience. I think that it's important, and I, I always uh, discuss this with Felix, it's important to see the perspective of a small country. Uruguay is a very small country, and Mercosur is, uh, is explained because the relation between Argentina and Brazil. And we need, sometimes we need an Argentina and a Brazil looking to the small countries, looking what the small countries need, because it's not only about Argentina and Brazil. We know that we agreed in the 90s to sign the Treaty of Asuncion, and we have obligations. But 30 years ago, when there are some things that in that obligations are not respect, are not complying, maybe it's time to discuss some changes. And that is what Uruguay wants. It's, uh, I, I leave it here for the moment, Bartek. Uh, thank you, Ignacio. And I, I would like to stay with you because uh, I think at this moment, uh, when we are talking about challenges, Uruguay is, is the place where those, uh, those solutions and ideas uh, are more like I, I expressed in the strongest way. Because I, I know your comments in, in social media, and I remember, remember also the, the strong speech of your president, uh, Lacadie Po, uh, on, the, on the summit of presidents, uh, about flexibilization as one of the solutions. And uh, I would like to ask you about this. What uh, Uruguay thinks as flexibilization, what would uh, solve uh, flexibilization from your perspective? Yes, Bartek, what we are trying to achieve in Mercosur is, okay, if we uh, doesn't have an agreement uh, that we want to advance uh, in, in, in close uh, a new free trade agreement with China, uh, with South Korea, or with, okay, let Uruguay to advance alone. One, as Felix said, we need to be flexible because Mercosur is flexible. If you, if you take a look to Article 1 of the Asuncion Treaty, every, everybody can agree that it's flexible because there are a lot of things there that we are not, that we never achieve. We never achieve a real custom union. We never, we have a lot of problems in that side. Okay, that's not, for me, it's not the problem. For me, it's okay. After 30 years, the international agenda of Mercosur, it's not very good because we haven't any agreement with the US, with China. We are waiting what's going on with the European Union agreement because from the European side, we know we have a lot of problems, but it's not only from the European side because we have some problems in the environmental issues in, in, in Brazil. We know it's part of the problem. It's not only the problem, but it's part of the problem. So what we are saying and what my president want to, 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 to achieve in Mercosur is, let us go with one uh, country that you don't want to, to sign. Uh, I think that we have uh, objective elements that uh, Argentina is, and Brazil are closed economies uh, in, in, in international trade terms. Because of the high tariffs and uh, because of the not barrier tariffs. We know that, that is objective. And they have a very strong uh, trade uh, bilateral and they have very important industries Uruguay is a small country with a small market and with a small industry and with a very competitive agriculture sector. So what we're saying is, please leave us. We, we, we want to be here. We want to accept what is Mercosur because we, we want to continue trading with Argentina, with Brazil. Argentina is part of Uruguay in, in, in terms of services, uh, cultural. Uh, it's, we want to be in this neighborhood. We don't want to go, but what we want to have one exception is not the, the, the anyone. We have already one exception with Mexico, but take uh, Uruguay closed a free trade agreement with Mexico without any problem. Uh, okay, it's part of Aladi. I know if we want to trade to have a free trade agreement with China, it's different because China is not part of a, of Aladi and is the second power around the world. But anyway, what we want to do is okay, we want to access to more markets because that is part of development. 
to Uruguay needs more access because we are paying a lot of tariffs for products and uh, and Australia, New Zealand, and RC and TPP. The world is closing agreements, and we are and we are not in that movie. We're not seeing that movie. And so what we want to ask to Brazil and to Argentina is, please, uh, we we need an external agenda, more dynamic, because the world is going faster than than us. Uh, thank you, Ignacio. And I would like to continue this uh, topic of what to do with with Mercosur to, for 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 this future. Uh, going to Renata Amaral, uh, because uh, when we think about uh, the finish of the talks between the European Union and Mercosur, uh, one of the factors was the change of the approach of Brazil with the uh, with the takeover of the government by Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. But I, as I remember uh, a conversation with a, an official from the government uh, from Brazil uh, who was dealing with trade issues, it was also part of the change in thinking in the business circles in, in Brazil to open more the country to the external trade. And what would, how do you, how would you see the, the change of the approach to Brazil and the view of the Mercosur for, for you, your country? I have to initiate with a disclaimer that um, um, it's a, a, well. I'm I'm not completely aligned with uh, the current uh, government of Brazil, for maybe obvious reasons. Uh, but um, uh, yes, uh, the, this is one maybe good thing of uh, of of the current uh, administration in Brazil is that they they are really. Um, they have they are aligned with uh, what president macri for example in the past was uh, was uh, trying to do is to, to open the market and to be more uh, to have more free trade with uh, with partners um, so I, I think that that's, that that would, can be viewed uh, for one side as a good thing i think we do really, really have an administration that it's at least uh, in the discourse more pro trade but i always say Bart, that uh, everybody is, is uh, um, agrees with free trade uh, if it's not in my own if i don't have to open my own market right everybody everybody agrees with that so i, I think in brazil there is another issue that uh, normally we blame the government uh, by being protectionist, but on, honestly, the private sector is really, really protectionist in Brazil. And I say that because I've lived many years in Brasilia following the, the, the meetings of the, of the coalition of industries and others. And I think this is very important to, to pin a point there because um, in Brazil, and also I believe that's also true for Argentina, maybe Uruguay, maybe less Uruguay, because there is this sense that Ignacio was talking about that we need more, uh, we, we need other partners because Brazil and Argentina are really, uh, they have really um, um, a close approach to trade and they, they, their industry is, is closely related. But honestly, I think also in Argentina, maybe Felix can correct me, but definitely in Brazil, the private sector is really protectionist. And I saw that very recently in Brasilia with uh, when we were talking about the, the baskets uh, for the EU agreement, uh, it was very hard to negotiate with the private sector because if you want, everybody wanted the, the agreement with the EU and others. But when you start to talk about lowering tariffs or quotas to for 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 the EU EU for EU products in the region or for US products pro, uh, products in the region, then you start to face challenges with the private sector, because we we are protectionist countries country for years, right? We we are we are used to. Um, substitution of imports approach, and then we have uh, local content requirements for many, many sectors. This was a problem for Brazil, also in the WTO very recently. Uh, so uh, I think it, um, uh, um, independently, 
of the change of governments, I think we need to change the mindset of the private sector as well, because it's really the private sector that, that incentivizes and that stimulates the negotiations or not. Of course, having a president now that really um, try, try to, to make the news all the time that he's, he's pro-trade, he's not protectionist, that everything's gonna change, maybe helps. Uh, we did finalize the, the deal with the EU, although it was, uh, I think we, we owe credit for the, past, uh, for the past administration also of Brazil for that, because they were really negotiating for years together with Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. And then uh, Bolsonaro came and in six months they, they signed the deal. But I, I don't think that's, that's only a merit of this administration. But, uh, but in my perspective, uh, but it's really, it's really not only an issue of government, of administration, but mainly the private sector. Because if we don't change the mindset of the private sector with regards to free trade, to free trade agreements, to exchange of goods and services, then it's very, very hard to advance with any, any, any new negotiation or to ratify the negotiations already signed. Uh, thank you, Renata. Yes, because we have to look at uh, Michel Temer as one of the phases that was uh, approaching to the more pro-market approach of Brazil. But just, uh, thank you for those interesting, inter interesting remarks. And I would like to go to, to Felix Peña to, to talk about Argentina, Argentina, because we had Mauricio Macri, who, who was a driver uh, in the last moment of negotiations with European Union, and then after the, 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 the talks uh, had been concluded, we had a change of government and uh, worsening of situation in Argentina and the government which was skeptical, at least at the electoral campaign, um, Alberto Fernandez was really critical of the, of the document. And then there was a decision to uh, uh, go out from the ongoing the negotiations and now we have Argentina uh, still as a pro, pro tempore president, president of Mercosur with some ideas between Brazil and Uruguay, as I understand. So if you'd like to add some, uh, the, some remarks about Argentine perspective specifics of the, uh, how to see the future of Mercosur. Uh Now, yes, yes, I will try to answer your question. Uh, I don't know if I will succeed. I would say that Argentina has not been, in my opinion, never against the agreement with the European Union. Once the agreement was the negotiation of the agreement was concluded. There was a change of government in Argentina. And it seems that particularly the new government wasn't so enthusiastic about the possibility of going through the Congress for the approval of the agreement. But I don't think that it's possible seriously to say that we don't have the agreement as a result of which was the position of the new Argentinian government. I have the feeling that the problem with the European Union Mercosur agreement today is basically an European problem in the sense that for different reasons, eventually good reasons, I don't know. But what I'm saying is that who has the responsibility of paralyzing the process of approval of the treaty is in the European side, not all the European countries, but at least some of the European countries. And I think that we must try to 
uh, introduce perspective that could allow us both Europe and Mercosur to conclude the agreement. And one of the way to help governments to go ahead with what they said it was necessary to do would be to discuss if some of the arguments are really sustainable arguments. Having in mind that a treaty, once it is concluded, and if you read the treaty, you can say that this is the case of the European Union Mercosur Treaty, will take some time, eventually a lot of time to be implemented. And so you could have a lot of mechanisms, methods that could allow you to build a definitive consensus, not about the general approach, but about the concrete approaches of each of the chapters of the treaty that imply to put the accent in the discussion. And this is the same in the case of Mercosur, how we could do things so could build consensus among us. And this was the real lesson we received early in the integration processes in our region from the European Union. I am a fanatic. I studied in Europe, but I am fanatic of Jean Monnet. And I would recommend a lot of people that are saying today how we should do to go ahead with the idea of integration among us. Please read the memories of Jean Monnet. You can find it in French, in Spanish, in English. No problem. Because it's the best lesson about how to build a consensus among different countries. And that implies that you cannot have a one model and only one way to do it, that you must listen. You must introduce the capacity to put together different approaches. And as an example of what I am saying, I must say that for a different reason, I have been working a lot the chapter of the bilateral, by regional agreement about uh, sustainable development. And sustainable development chapter is something very, very, very interesting. It has been very well written. One of the main elements that surprised me in the chapter is the concept of working together. The chapter of sustainable development is the only chapter that has not been introduced within the chapter of settlement dispute that implied a more formalistic approach to disagreements. And the working together approach for the different elements of the chapter imply that we must develop a process of working together for many years eventually to construct a region based in consensus. This is not easy. We must do it well. 30 years ago, we are saying that we'll have an agreement between the European Union and Mercosur country. Sometimes, sometimes, and I am very positive and optimistic guy, but sometimes I raise the question myself, really they want to have an agreement? Or they say they want to have an agreement to provoke the United States. And so, and I finish with this provocation. And so finally, I raise my main question is, what would happen if today we announce formally the initiation of a bi-regional agreement between Mercosur and China? It will be the reaction of many of our European friends in some key industrial sectors. Or which will be the reaction in the United States? Well, to say something, to provoke, I, I, 
I, I think it's necessary to provoke people to think new ideas and new approaches to all problems. Thank you very much, uh, Felix. And uh, I I'm, thank you for this for talking about China because because actually that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. And I would like to move to Hanata Marao, asking two things uh, to, to get one of the questions that arise in Q&A uh, here. Uh, what, how, what perspective for ratification of EU Mercosur agreement do you see having in mind that Brazil is uh, for, from European perspective a problem? And the second part of the question, how do you see that in context of China rise in uh, Latin America and especially in, in, in Mercosur? Let me, those are not easy questions. <laughs> Let me start with, uh, with uh, Brazil seeing as a problem for the ratification of the EU agreement. I think um, it's, it's hard not to say that there aren't issues with, uh, with uh, environment, environment and climate related uh, with the current administration. You know that our Minister of Environment uh, fell last week. Um, and I think that could be maybe a good sign for the future, we'll see. Uh, but honestly, I see the agreement, the EU-Mercosur agreement as um, something uh, good in the sense, especially for Brazil, because uh, the, the agreement, as you know, has very strict rules on uh, sustainable development, on environment, on climate, on labor rights. Uh, by, by ratifying the agreement, I believe it's a way to force Brazil and other countries of the region to implement the rules of the agreement inside their own territories, right? There is also a dispute settlement uh, um, uh, related to, to those issues in the agreement, which would, al which, which would allow and help the enforcement of the provisions. So I see the, the EU Mercosur agreement as something really, really good in this sense, thinking about the uh, ways to bring the country, uh, especially Brazil, because I, I know this is a problem, especially with Brazil and not with the other countries of the, of the bloc, to bring its measures into compliance, as we say in the WTO, right? Into compliance with the, WTO, with the Mercosur EU agreement. So I honestly see uh, the agreement as a way, as a means of uh, enforcing stricter uh, standards on environment and climate as the EU has itself for its own member countries. Um, the other questions, uh, question on China. I think maybe Ignacio can talk the, about this better than me because uh, um, as you know, it's it's. It, I think it's it's interesting how Brazil is dealing with China now because, as you know, Bolsonaro was very aligned with Trump until the end of last year. So what I mean by that is that Brazil was trying to repeal China in many ways, uh, although we cannot afford the luxury of repealing China, as you know, is our main trading partner uh, nowadays. It's, it's the, the, the main destination of our exports. Uh, but I see China as, with a very, a very clear approach to Latin America, also through the Belt and Road Initiative. Also, Brazil is not part of the initiative, but through the initiative, I think China is really building its way into Latin America. And also China has, has given a lot of money for infrastructure products, pro projects also in Brazil. So I see China rising significantly in the region. There is a very good report that was published uh, this month, I think, uh, on China and Latin America 2035 by the Atlantic Council, which is a think tank here from DC. And they discuss basically this, like the, the st strategy. China has, has a very clear strategy with the world, actually, and uh, now more focused on Latin America. I think this is going to be interesting, um, an interesting develop development to follow, especially here from DC, because as you know, uh, um, President Biden here is trying to also 
uh, near shore, uh, the supply chains in the region is trying to, to reestablish the US um, um, power in, within the region. And, but China is already uh, really, really spread around Latin American countries and South America and Mercosur. Um, so I think it's going to be an interesting geopolitical movement to watch for the, for the, for the past years especially um, having now a new administration here in the US, how, how, is, how is this puzzle going to, to be arranged? China, the US, Latin America, and especially Mercosur and Brazil. So I think there is more to see, things are changing, the parts are, ch the mo the parts are moving, right, of the puzzle, but I think um, China is, is um, first a trade partner that we cannot, afford the luxury of not having. Uh, I'm talking by, for Brazil. Uh, and I think uh, we're gonna have to find a ways to, to, to better our diplomacy with China very quickly uh, if we, want, we don't want to miss that, that, that important trade partner because we really cannot afford that luxury. Renata, thank you very much. Uh, as we are uh, running out of time, just one brief question, uh, I think short but difficult to, to Ignacio. What would be the first like bilateral Uruguay, Uruguay China trade agreement or ratification of EU Mercosur agreement? No, no, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> but like, no, we, we, we want to ratify the European Union agreement. Of course, the impact for Mercosur is. Uh, more important uh, uh, to, to have that agreement in force, the European Union agreement for the future of Mercosur and also the impact that it's going to have in the internal agenda uh, and in, in be more strict, like uh, Renata said, in, in, in complying all the, the compromise we have in Mercosur. But uh, as, as, as we know, we, it, 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 we don't know what's going to happen with that agreement. So what, what, what are you going to do instead? We're going to wait. I think we need to, to advance. So, of course, for Uruguay to sign a free trade agreement with China is, is part of what we want. And we want to have a, a view of what's going on with China. And we know that at the moment, uh, as Renata said, Brazil is not looking to China. Yes, of course, we have a lot of investment in infrastructure. Argentina has also a lot of projects with China, but not in trade. It, Anyway, uh, Brazil is looking with Bolsonaro to the US, only to the US, but 30% of exports goes to China. So that is the, the problem. And, and we don't have an idea how to deal with China altogether. That's a, a very hard problem of Latin America and of Mercosur countries. We don't have a, a general idea about China. We need to have general idea because if, if not, China always win in the bilateral uh, arena. So. I think that Mercosur is not prepared at the moment to react to China. It's not prepared. Uh, it's not in the agenda of Argentina, of course, in this government. It's not in the agenda of Argentina uh, and uh, in, the, in the agenda of Brazil. Yes, it's in the agenda of Uruguay. And China wants to have a step in the region. Of course, China was not of because not of because our huge market because we are very small, but China wants to be more near, uh, of course, Argentina, Brazil, and wants to 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 lead with the situation of Paraguay that, as you know, has diplomatic relations with Taiwan. That is incredible. In Mercosur, we have Paraguay that has relation with Taiwan. So uh, it's impossible to look uh, at a general idea about China if, if we have a member of Mercosur that has a diplomatic relation with Taiwan. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, I think that we have to look this in, in two different uh, roles. We want free trade agreement with the European Union in force, but we also want to have an agreement and a bilateral agreement with China and that uh, waiver uh, we wanted to achieve in Mercosur in, 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 this, uh, in the next months. Many thanks, Ignacio. Many thanks to our distinguished speakers. Uh, we, uh, you are, we have finished our debate and I, we, we touched a lot of topics related to Mercosur. I hope this would be very inspiring for our audience. 
it now uh, I would like to pass to the second part of our meeting, uh, where we'll have two perspectives uh, from uh, European experts, uh, one expert from uh, Brussels and the other from, from Poland. So uh, let me first introduce the uh, first speaker, which will be uh, Emily Rees, who is senior researcher in the European Center for International Political Economy, ISTYPE, and recently uh, she has taken over as leader of the EU Mercosur project. She's also managing director at trade strategies at trade and regulatory advisory consultancy. She has a rich experience in trade policy and economic diplomacy. She led uh, Brazil's trade and investment promotion in Brazil, and she also worked as deputy trade attaché of France in Brazil. Our second uh, Voice will come from Wojciech Baczyński, who is Director General for the Polish Portuguese Chambers of Commerce, uh, which de facto works on Portuguese speaking countries in Brazil. He also has experience in Polish economic diplomacy as a Vice Consul for Trade Affairs in Sao Paulo. So let me pass straightly to Emily Ries to hear her comments regarding European perspective uh, of Mercosur. Thank you very much, Bart, and thank you to everyone and for this very inspiring debate that we've just heard. I've learned a lot. So uh, maybe just picking up on uh, a couple of the key points of what we've just heard. Uh, I think that as Europeans, we're often guilty of equating the Mercosur bloc as a mirror of our own European integration. And as we've heard in this uh, excellent panel, that's not always the case, that our own integration has followed its own process. And Mercosur, as it reaches its 30th anniversary, is also on its own course uh, with its own challenges now. Um, both keeping in mind were built on the same idea of peace and cooperation, echoing uh, Felix's words on that. Um, where we're at, as it was earlier mentioned, uh, two years ago, the EU and Mercosur, so they reached this political agreement, uh, which is a political sort of alignment of the stars uh, that enabled uh, uh, reaching this agreement in principle, right? And I think that we have to keep in mind that that was no mean feat for Europe um, to reach an agreement with one of the world's most economically protected and closed regions in the world. As has been mentioned, Mercosur doesn't have large free trade agreements with other big partners uh, to date. And yet we've seen that the political will towards this agreement has chilled somewhat since. Um, that's now leading us to a, a, a moment where there is a real risk um, that this agreement could uh, remain unratified. Um, and that would have lasting effects for both regions um, and of course their relations. And I just like to touch on three of the main effects that not ratifying this agreement could have for Europe and for Mercosur to a lesser extent. Um, on the first hand, um, in Europe, we've been building this um, new strategic autonomy, uh, open strategic autonomy as our trade policy, you know, also in the light of uh, the way that we want to tackle questions relating to climate change, but also the rise of China. Um, and when we look at Mercosur, again, it's a region that has been protected by high tariff barriers and um, whoever was going to move into that region first, um, uh, without that sound sounding uh, um, uh, uh, too harsh, uh, would gain that competitive first mover advantage in terms of trading and competitiveness. So if it's not going to be the EU, then who is it going to be? And, and again, we, we've heard the, 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 the name of China come up. Uh, a couple of times in this debate. Um, the, the EU trade strategy basically stresses the importance of building resilience um, and building resilience through diversification of our trading partners. And, and that's why there are real opportunities, right, for, for European companies in particular uh, to broaden their, we can call them transatlantic horizons, um, by securing, you know, these new partners or, or, or firming uh, relations that already exist with a market that is 
quite a large market um, in consideration of Europe. It's more or less half uh, the size of, of the European Union with 284 million people. Um, and that is going to become even more relevant now that we're looking at the impact of COVID, um, which is obviously going to change, I would say, the economics and the, the, the supply chain um, uh, dynamics that we're seeing in the world. And what we're looking at in Europe in many ways is to narrow our reliance on China, right? Uh, expanding global consumer market bases. And so that's why this deal works so well towards this EU objective of open strategic autonomy, yeah? Um, it, it also would allow the EU to reinforce uh, its soft power. And when I'm saying soft power, we often call it the Brussels effect, which is basically the ability to influence regulations and, and decision making in other parts of the world to ensure an uptaking of standards which are closest to our own, right? Um, and in that regard, we've already had some examples of how Mercosur has done this, you know? There's an example, for instance, in Brazil that adopted, you know, a GDPR type legislation, which is sort of the, 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 the legislation governing data protection. I mean, that really showed the, the potency of the Brussels effect, and it showed that the EU standards were able to actually have impact in regions that have traditionally been closer to the US in terms of standards. When, when countries adopt European standards or that there is a convergence towards the way uh, uh, Europe legislates, that makes our companies more competitive. So, I mean, that's really why it's the name of the game uh, today, beyond obviously the tariff effects, which obviously promote um, uh, competitiveness. So as we've seen, there's a lot of discussions right now around the question of environment and climate change, and as it should be with the U European Union, which is now uh, implementing its European Green Deal and putting a huge amount of investment into that. So if the environment is now becoming the issue to ratifying this agreement, one has to ask oneself, what is the EU's objective then with regards to this region? You know, because the EU's long has promoted through its trade agreements, and we heard quite a lot about the sustainable development provisions and the, the area of working together, right? Um, the EU's way of looking at free trade agreements is also to include in that chapter a number of what we would call perhaps non-trade issues, right, from human rights to biodiversity. And in a, a way, this uh, agreement also goes beyond that trade pillar, right? It, it also has other dimensions, such as the development dimension and the political dimension. But again, so if one of our primary purposes with this trade deal in Europe is to ba basically get better enforcement of sustainability standards in the region, guarantee um, a more level playing field, it's often um, one of the arguments that we hear in Europe, particularly from the farming community, then actually a trade deal is a really good starting point because as was mentioned, it puts in a number of rules that we can then base our relationship on. Um, I've often said that these uh, trade agreements um, are more uh, are more like um, uh, a marriage uh, than anything else. It's it's really over time that we see the uh, the relationship evolve. Uh, what we've just done is probably uh, we've got engaged. Now we need to go uh, uh, and have the wedding, and then we need to live this relationship out. And so that's very much where we're at. So when we come back to the question of enforcing environmental and social commitments, what a free trade agreement allows us to do is actually put in rules that go beyond the World Trade Organization um, and that are enforceable, right? Um, the, a lot of the questions around deforestation um, and in particular embedded deforestation are quite difficult to tackle. Um, and that is mostly because most of the issues that we have of deforestation in the region are actually unrelated to trade. They have different drivers, right, than international trade. So then obviously it spurs a new debate, I would say in Europe and one that we will hear a lot in the European Parliament into the new year, absolutely, which is the question of how can a free trade agreement then tackle this sort of non-trade issue, which is embedded deforestation or de illegal deforestation, right? Um, so 
in effect, there's a question here of un, under wanting to answer the question of whether a trade deal can curb deforestation. And the answer to that is probably not. But what trade deals do in this marriage is that they create a, a good ambiance and opportunity for both partners to sit down and, and perhaps tackle the harder issues, including deforestation, and work together on solutions in a cooperative manner. And so in that sense, you know, trade deals really are the EU's strongest form of diplomacy, right? Which is why uh, the EU has been so keen on expanding its network of trade deals throughout the world. Now, finally, I'd like to touch on a point that's been made um, already uh, to certain degrees. And I'm sure that uh, the, the panelists that we've just heard from are, are far better experts on this subject than I. But it's the question of the long-term unintended consequences on the Mercosur block of not getting this deal through for Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, we've heard today that for Mercosur, um, getting this closer relationship to Europe is so strategic and important. Um, bigger to the Oro Preto protocol, uh, according to Ignacio, and I really uh, liked that, um, uh, that point. Um, but until now, uh, I would say there are questions as to whether the EU has been able to leverage the agreement in principle uh, to really assert the change that it wants before ratification, or whether you need to have a ratification process that starts in order to gain that leverage. Um, these are really big questions. Also, as we've seen due to the fact that China is securing a long-term dominant position in that region. And that is something that for Europe should be a preoccupation, especially when you've got a trade deal sitting on the table, right? Um, so, I mean, we, we've talked also about the, the other less obvious risks, right, to the Mercosur countries themselves and this flexing perhaps of the customs union um, and what that could mean for Europe if, you know, if Uruguay decides to strike a trade deal with China, I'm sure that that would um, certainly have quite a political impact um, in Europe. So uh, the, the question of being able to use this agreement also as a way to cement Mercosur from a European perspective is of geopolitical uh, strategic interest. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Emily, uh, for insightful views and your expertise, because you're a real expert on, on that perspective. So now to make it like to complement that, let me ask Wojtek Baczyński uh, from Polish Portuguese Chamber of Commerce to give some comments on the, the Polish uh, point of view. I would like to ask Wojtek also to address one of the questions that appeared in Q&A about uh, the recent uh, negative vision from Argentinian and Brazilian industrial federations on Mercosur EU agreement. Wojtek, the floor is yours. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation to PISM and to Bartek to take part in this panel with such distinguished guests from the Mercosur block. First of all, congratulations to the Mercosur block for the 30 years of, of existing and developing. And I believe my role here would be to summarize the Polish position in the mainstream at least uh, about the EU Mercosur agreement. Um, I would like to say that first of all, my work has been uh, mostly focused to the Polish-Brazilian relations also on the micro level, uh, being our uh, main field of activity, connecting companies to generally um, create more um, substance in terms of Polish-Brazilian um, trade relations by several instruments. So, well, uh, in Poland, uh, first of all, the EU-Mercosul agreement is seen as a, a opportunity to create the biggest trade agreement uh, with uh, two blocks of uh, huge population of almost 800 million people with huge potential um, and uh, having in mind that the European Union has a uh, very big uh, trade level with Mercosur and uh, also European Union is the biggest investor in uh, still in, uh, in the Mercosur block. Uh, this all, as it has been said, in the framework where we see China rising uh, as a main 
uh, trade partner of most of Mercosur countries and rising, especially in the last uh, months during COVID. It was uh, visible that uh, China presence in the bloc has been uh, stronger and stronger and been rising in, in the stronger way than the European Union one. For Poland, it is a overall good opportunity to further expand our uh, dynamic export flows. Uh, and here uh, I would like to remind that 80% of Polish exports is destined to the European Union countries, while uh, only 58% of Polish imports uh, is coming from European Union countries. That means 42% of Polish imports comes from non-European Union countries, including Mercosur. Uh, at the same time, Poland uh, is a small partner of uh, huge economies such as Brazil. Our exports uh, uh, amounts to only 0.2% um, of uh, total of Polish exports to Brazil and our imports 0.4% uh, from Brazil as a total of uh, share of, of all uh, imports. So um, as for the opportunities and benefits of the trade agreement in Poland, it's widely perceived that it uh, would create a bilateral access to uh, South American markets um, in the Mercosur bloc. And it would be basically good for Polish and European Union uh, industry products and also services. Uh, here we cannot forget that Brazil is a net importer of net importer of services, and we cannot forget the opportunities that could be created in the access of uh, European services or tenders. Um, on the other side, uh, in Poland, we have a quite. Uh, critical position of agricultural sector, as you, as, as you know, which is shared with some other European countries, which basically uh, means that uh, the associations and the representative of the sectors are afraid that uh, it would mean um, the access of uh, South American uh, agricultural products that will not meet uh, the quality requirements which are encountered in Europe. Uh, also use of pesticides and use of uh, genetic genetical engineering is are points which are commonly um, current, commonly spread um, in the discussion inside Polish agriculture industry. Um, I would say that uh, this develop this uh, agreement would be uh, very good for Polish processed goods in which uh, Poland specializes and uh, increases its export flows. Um, that, would, that, that would be Polish agricultural pro products, uh, selected Polish agricultural products. That would be cosmetics, uh, which are a huge hit on the foreign markets. That would be, to some extent, uh, furniture, also gaming industry. Um, and we cannot forget about the services impact where the agreement could be beneficial for uh, our IT uh, companies and also software producers. Um, that means that in the general uh, discussion on Mercosur, uh, the mainstream idea would be that the, um, this agreement would be beneficial if Polish government is able to find uh, a negotiating position that could uh, somehow make the agriculture sector calmer uh, and negotiate interesting transition periods in terms of the details of the agreement. Uh, I was looking for some data regarding uh, other trade agreements that European Union has been uh, has completed. Uh, and here we talk about South Korea, we talk about Canada, we talk about Ukraine and Japan, and uh, their impact in uh, Polish uh, export flows. And it is visible that um, 
it, they had uh, a relatively good impact uh, over the perspective last four years, especially Polish exports to Ukraine uh, and to Canada. But at the same time, we have been lagging in terms of um, the fulfilling the potential as the uh, the numbers for the medium European Union positive impact has been usually twice higher, with uh, exception of Ukraine. Uh, and also, uh, in terms of the items, the usage of the preferential tariffs uh, were only used in 77%. That means only 77% of the, uh, of the items uh, have been exported. Uh, which gives us uh, 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 unfulfilled po potential inside unfulfilled po potential. Um, in terms of the worries, so uh, for sure the ratification progress is lagging, uh, and this has been widely discussed today, uh, mostly in the terms of the reforestation biodiversity focused on Brazil. Yet, I do not believe that uh, this is the critical issue um, for the European Union. Um, other worries, and this is maybe my personal opinion, is about uh, the non-tariffary barriers, uh, which is also has been also visible in uh, other trade agreements, with, especially with South Korea. So, for example, uh, I would be afraid of um, some um, maintaining the, the barriers that are already existing in terms of non-tariff. I'm talking on visa, I'm talking, I'm talking in MAPA and so on and so forth. Um, so that could be a problem uh, even if the, even with positive uh, impact of the agreement and also uh, the labor law. Uh, and here I'm relating only to Brazil, which is a country which, uh, which I'm, uh, I'm taking care of, uh, which could be um, a big, still a big challenge uh, to European investors. And here I would um, strongly agree with Ms. Renata um, on, uh, on that, on the need of reinforcing uh, the results of uh, future detailed agreement uh, that will be ratified. Um, and then my last comment would be about uh, Polish field uh, or national field. Um, we are talking about two blocks that are geograph geographically very distant, that are not always complementary uh, as economies. Uh, that has um, somehow a different business culture. Um, and uh, this all in the situation where Polish companies are still lagging in terms of creating their own distribution channels. So in general, uh, South America requires a lot of local presence, uh, understanding of the culture, personal relations, and explaining of local reality to European companies. Uh, and here I would say uh, that uh, we are lagging uh, as a country without any trade office in Brazil at the moment, with, let's say, 50% office in Buenos Aires, without an office in Montevideo. Um, so my challenge here uh, to the Polish audience and to the Polish authorities would be to um, consider changing the situation, uh, having in mind the distances and the differences that I mentioned uh, uh, recently. So uh, that would be all as, uh, as my personal comment, comment from this micro perspective. Um, and uh, regarding to the question that was uh, asked by Bartek, I think that was answered by Ms. Renata Amaral before. Um, Brazilian industry uh, has a right to, uh, to be skeptical about this agreement because, in my opinion, this agreement uh, creates uh, deeper challenges to, 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 to local industry. Uh, so here we are talking about the change of uh, 
points of view, perspective, perspectives or gr more global visions and uh, possibility of creating mutual benefits, just as Mr. Felix has said, we have to tackle this, this issue overall and find the right balance. Um, so that would be my comment on the question. Thank you very much, uh, Wojciech. Uh, that will be at the end of two excellent parts about Mercosur and European perspective. I hope that all audience uh, enjoyed that. But let me move to Damian Lukowski, coordinator of Asia Pacific Group at PISP, to summarize and to wrap up our meeting. Thank you, Bartek. Uh, as we had run out of time already, I will be. I will try to be a very brief uh, in my summary. First of all, I would like to thank all of our panelists uh, from uh, Mercosur countries, our commentators from the European side, for very insightful remarks, very comprehensive uh, discussion. We had this historical background of Mercosur, the legal aspects, the economic aspects, political ones. So uh, for me, as, an, uh, as a person who does not uh, deal with Mercosur on a day-to-day -day basis, it was very interesting and uh, I learned a lot from your discussion. And just uh, let me make uh, three points which um, uh, relates to especially EU-Mercosur relations with, in uh, different aspects. First of all, from, for me in this discussion, it also uh, was quite clear that this economic dimension is uh, still the crucial one. Um, and for both sides, those are prospective markets. Mercosur for the European Union, uh, the, um, the European Union for the Mercosur. So we need each other in the future, especially as uh, Ms. Rees said that um, the pandemic and the situation after the pandemic, the, re the recovery, how we can rebuild our economies. I think those relations between the EU and partners all over the world, the Mercosur uh, as one of them, will be crucial and we should uh, take care of them and, and make as much as we can. And for Poland, it's also, as uh, Mr. Baczynski mentioned, that the expansion of our export and what is a very important diversification of our trade relations, investment relations, which are highly dependent on the EU market, are also crucial. And we also see the potential in Mercosur countries. Of course, it's not, um, it's not tapped uh, for now, but we hope that uh, the, the association agreement and all the uh, trade-related issues in this, uh, in this uh, document will help us to um, to be more present on the Mercosur market, if it will be ratified, we hope so. Even given all those uh, problems with um, uh, on, on both sides, on, on the EU side from the agricultural sector, I hope that it will be uh, it will be uh, ratified. And what Ms. Amaral mentioned about the free trade, it, we support free trade if it does not mean that we should open our markets uh, and uh, this change of mindset, as Ms. Amaral said, it's very important to change it on the, uh, from the business side, but also from the society side. And I think that it will be a great task in the changing globalization time, uh, in changing trade patterns, to show that free trade, of course, not uh, free in all dimensions, but free trade can support economic growth and also the social development. So this is the first point. The second one, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Pena mentioned it, and I fully agree. We can't only um, uh, look at EU-Mercosur relations, the agreement between both sides as an economic um, issue, but also a political one. And in the changing international environment, the cooperation between um, partners from the EU and, and Mercosur would be could be crucial for preserving peace, international order uh, based on international law, Multilateralism, which is also um, very important for the for the EU to create this or recreate the, the network of cooperation in uh, multilateral forms and strengthen international organizations. Uh, we see Mercosur as an important um, partner in this challenge, and also uh, even um, uh, given the um, uh, differences in deforestation issues, um, uh, sustainable development in the longer term. Global issues would be the main driver, or one of main drivers for the uh, EU Mercosur relations, and we need each other, both our regions, to uh, face those challenges. And the third one, 
Um, I am the coordinator of the Asia Pacific uh, program and I mostly focus on East Asia. That's why I was looking for this China factor, how it will be present in um, our panelists' uh, remarks. And I fully agree that the presence of China in Mercosur, in many parts of the world, but Mercosur is one of them, is uh, highly visible during the pandemic. It probably has grown, so it makes stronger position, which will have um, uh, implications for the EU. And the agreement which um, uh, could be ratified could strengthen EU towards China in the region. If it does not um, uh, fulfill, uh, then China probably will uh, make it uh, position even stronger. Mrs. Mr. Pena, uh, I, uh, as I suppose, uh, mentioned about what uh, what would be the reaction of the EU or the US on the Mercosur uh, China trade agreement. I think it will uh, be a wake up call, but I think it would be a little bit too late wake up call. So we should work um, uh, now and we should uh, try to create an idea on China, as Mr. Bartosagi said. I, I hope that EU and Mercosur will try to um, jointly uh, forge this idea how to deal with China on the global uh, on the global scene. And I think EU, along with other partners, the US was mentioned as one of them, but not only, could be a great um, partner for Mercosur to, clear, to create an alternative for China, not only in economic terms, but also in political ones and normative ones to show our offer for the countries in the region, but also in the, in the global area, the global stage, um, uh, as an alternative to to China's um, uh, to China's offer. Uh, having said that, I would, uh, I would like to um, uh, end our meeting. But at the end, I would like to thank uh, our team uh, from um, from from Pearson, especially Bartek, who is our leading expert on uh, South American. Uh, issues and it was his idea to, to um, prepare this, uh, to, this seminar to promote EU Mercosur relations and knowledge about Mercosur uh, in Poland. Also, our um, our uh, team from the information office, uh, all other um, uh, all other people who uh, contributed to preparing this seminar, and of course, last but not least, once more, I would like to thank our uh, panelists our commentators for a great discussion. And I, um, I, I would like to invite you for all the other um, seminars and events organized by the Polish Institute of International Affairs, not only on Mercosur, but I hope it will be um, not the only one. I'm sure it will be not the only one. And uh, the South American uh, and EU South America, EU Mercosur issues will be um, still in, uh, in, in our work visible and present. Thank you very much.